Now, let me say that some of the questions are asking basically for a judgment call for me. So all I can do is, is uh, read the Bible and see what it has to say, make a reference to verses or passages, and, and let the Bible do the talking. And uh, I know that every question was asked uh, from pure motives, and that's good. And, and as somebody said, I think it was Alan over here, said that it's good that people are asking questions. That's a, that's a good sign that people are uh, wanting to learn and wanting to ask questions. Uh, that's much better than going through this whole process and not having any questions submitted at all. Of course, it could be a reflection on the teaching, too, that maybe some things weren't answered, but we'll, we'll go with the first one on that one. Okay, so like I said, some of these um, have been answered either in a lesson or is going to be in a lesson. So but I'm, I'm going to go through these just to be respectful of the questions. Okay, does an elder not have to formally preach or teach in front of the congregation to be qualified? Uh, we talked about that this morning. An elder needs to be apt to teach. Okay, which, remember the, the three things I said was that that word apt means ready, willing, and able to teach. I think it is good from time to time to see him in front of the audience from time to time to teach. However, that should not be made a requirement because there are some elders that I know that are super, super good at going into people's homes and teaching what we refer to as home Bible study. They're, they have a penchant for that, but maybe they're not as comfortable. Okay, how many, let's just have a show of hands. How many of us have a fear of public speaking in this room? Okay, we might have a room of, of liars too because, <laughs> because the number one and number two fears in all the world are death and public speaking. Okay, some people would rather die than to publicly speak. Okay, that's, just, that's, how they, that's how they order that kind of thing. Okay, so public speaking is a hard thing to do and most people don't want to do it. All right? However, I think it'd be good from time to time to see an elder get up here and teach a class or maybe a, a quarter's worth of classes. But to say that he needs to be up there all the time and he, then he's not qualified, that's unfair to him because you don't know what he's doing privately. You don't know what he's doing uh, with his coworkers, if he's still working, or any other number of places. Okay? But he needs to be ready and willing and able to teach. That's what apt to teach means there in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Okay, uh, hopefully I can read all these. Scripture indicates elders are not to lord over the flock with a heavy hand. They obviously have a responsibility to watch over the flock. Uh, can you please speak to these responsibilities in getting uh, too personal with the flock? I've heard of elders in the church that have tried to influence where individuals go to college or have families spend their money. Uh, where does the responsibility of the elders to the flock become too personal? Maybe when? When does, when does it become too personal? Okay, so I, I might direct this to 1 Peter chapter 5 uh, in answering that question. Some of this we're going to get to tomorrow uh, and the responsibility to the flock and, and vice versa. But um, the reference here, I believe, is, is the 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 3. But it does say in verse 3, as the question intimated, that yes, they are elders, they are shepherds, but they're not lords over God's heritage, but they're to be what? But they are to be examples to the flock. Okay, so this... This kind of goes hand in hand with what I said a little while ago about a father. Okay, a, a father uh, ruling his house with an open, loving hand, okay, and not an iron fist. Okay, an iron fist ruling mechanism doesn't work very well, does it? Okay, what happens? But by the way, you can make comments if I ask you a question. We're kind of in the Bible study book. What happens when somebody tries to rule with an iron fist? What happens? What's the result of that? I'm sorry? Okay, rebellion. Uh, what do you mean by that? Okay. Yeah, they get tired of the iron fist, don't they? Okay. And, um, that, and this is true whether, whether it's a husband, wife, parent, child. That too can happen with elders and flock. Okay. Elders have rule and authority over the flock in a lot of matters. Okay. Um, now, we get into some of those opinion things, like where are you going to go to college and how do you spend your money and those sorts of things. Now, if, if the individual goes to the elders and says, hey, we would like some advice on money management or 
uh, picking, helping pick a college, that's one thing, okay? Elders would probably sit down and talk with you about those things. Uh, I'm of the opinion, uh, the word opinion, that unsolicited advice really ought not to be given, okay? Uh, I preach a lesson sometimes called, we all have one. Okay, and one thing we all have is an opinion. But this, because we have it, doesn't mean we have to do what? Share it, okay? Have you ever been in a conversation before and somebody says, uh, I'm going to give you my opinion, and I, I'm listening to this, and I'm like, I don't remember asking you for it. I don't remember asking you for that, okay? So there, there comes a point, doesn't there? Okay, the elders have, they're, they're trying to spiritually oversee the flock, okay? Now, it could be that they, in those, they may have noticed something that, Maybe, maybe there's something going on with the child who was a Christian and maybe gone off to college and, and kind of, you know, as children want to do. They might notice that, okay? And they, and they might say something about that out of love, okay? But just to go to somebody and say, you know, your child can't go to college here. They have to go to college here. That's, that becomes a problem, doesn't it? Okay, or you're spending too much money on groceries or, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. Okay, those, those things really shouldn't be brought up, okay? And like I said... If they go to the elders and ask about that, that's a little bit of a different scenario. Okay, but they are, but they are to be an example to the flock. They rule over the flock. Okay, we'll talk about that some more in some other questions. All right, but it can become too heavy-handed. Okay, and as the brother said there in the back, what you're gonna, what happens is, okay, those people, uh, in some way, will rebel. Okay, what, what that means, uh, try to um, rid him of being an elder, or, or somebody or try to rid the eldership altogether, or they just might say, you know, we're gonna go somewhere else. We're gonna go somewhere else, where maybe that kind of thing's not going on. Okay, and like I said, I think yesterday, we have, we live in a metropolitan area of, I don't know how many uh, sound groups there are, but there's a lot of them. Okay, so if you become disgruntled, it's easy to go down the road and find somewhere else. Okay, I'm not saying you should be doing that. Nobody, should, we should be trying to work out our issues. Okay, whatever those are, but it does happen. Okay, uh, let's see here. Okay, this is, I'm, I'm noticing that I'm having to take my glasses off the reason things. Okay, um, at what point does a person's past no longer apply to their current qualification status? For example, I'm sure some people <clears throat> have questions on divorce right now. At the point in time, a person uh, may be the husband of one wife, though in his entire life, he was a husband to many, to many women. Or in the past, the man was having anger issues, but now are resolved. In my current view, I'm looking at Paul as an example of people change, changing and can't be defined by what they were, but what they currently are. Okay, and that's, I don't know who wrote the question, but that last statement is a good one. Paul's a good person uh, to look at. Okay, a couple of verses here. Uh, first off, in Philippians chapter 4. Okay, Philippians 4. Philippians chapter 3, rather. Philippians 3. Verse 13, okay, Paul said, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, okay, what, what was the one thing he said he did here? I'm, I'm going to do what with those things that are behind? I'm going to do what? I'm going to forget them, forgetting those things that are behind and reach forth unto those things which are before, okay, and did not Paul refer to himself in 1 Timothy chapter 1, who before was a blasphemer, injurious, uh, and he says, of all the sinners, I, I, I am what? Remember what he said? I am, I'm chief there in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. So if anybody, if anybody could let a past stranglehold them down, it would be the Apostle Paul, wouldn't it? Now, one other verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Actually, look at one word. Okay, one word can make a big difference in the Bible. Okay, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. This is one of those lists that are famous in the Bible. This is a list of those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. But look in verse number 11. That, this is the Old King James, but the third word is so important. Okay, if you have the Old King James, you might read with me and say it out loud. And such were. He might highlight that. And such, what was that? And such were some of you. What's that, what's that word were indicate to you? That was in your past. Maybe in the past you were an extortioner. Maybe in the past you were an adulterer. Maybe in the past you were a thief. But that was in your what? That was in your past. Okay, that was in your past. Now, to the question, 
this real quick. Okay? There, there may be some, some time needed to build back up trust. Okay? But for somebody, see, you know what, 20 years ago, you, you did this, and therefore you can't be qualified to be an elder. Okay? It's, it's not the right attitude to have, is it? We all, we all have past. That's another thing we all have. We all have a past. We all have things we regret doing, regret saying. We, we beg forgiveness and move on with, with our life. Okay? And if somebody else wants to, to try to bury the hatchet with the handle still sticking out, to grab it back out a little bit later on, that's their issue and not yours. Okay? However, having said that, we have to be patient with people. If, if I do make a mistake with somebody, I just can't expect them the very next day to go back to zero level, if you understand what I'm saying. Okay? There's an old, old poem about builder or wrecker. Okay, how long does it take to build a building? How long do you think it took to build this building? Anybody know? Anybody know how long it took to build this building? About two, years. two years. Wow. How long, if we, all, if we all really tried hard, how long do you think it would take for all of us here today to knock it down? How long do you think it would take? Two years? It wouldn't take two years. We could probably do it in one day, couldn't we? If we really, I mean, if we really, I, mean, I understand there was a fire way back 1960-something or whatever. Okay, how long did the fire take to destroy that building? One day, okay, probably hours, okay? So the point I'm trying to make is it takes a long time to build up some trust, a while to build up trust, okay? It takes, it takes just one moment of folly in, in my decision-making uh, to cause people to lose some trust in me, okay? It takes a little while to build that back up, okay? So if that's me asking this question, I need to give the people some time, okay? Uh, not to make demand, to give them some time uh, to build that trust back up because it takes a while to build that uh, back up again. Okay, the second question in Titus, what does faithful children mean? Okay, we've answered that faithful to their father or God. Uh, what about the man who raises his children according to scripture and has done everything correctly uh, in that manner, but the children aren't baptized yet? Um, and they put down, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Okay, and, uh, and we understand what the connection to that is. Okay, I can sympathize with the question. I think all of us can sympathize with the question. But when you go to the text and, and see what it says, having faithful children, okay, having children who believe, as we went back and saw those texts in Acts 10, Acts 11, and Acts 16. The same word believe means somebody who became a Christian. Now, allow me to say this. I'm not going to mention names, but I know of some people in my life who, because of a series of incidents, whatever you want to call it, okay, um, cannot be elders, okay, because they're not qualified, either along these lines or maybe some other lines. Usually it's, it's along family lines. Okay, let me say this, okay, I don't know who asked this, it's not my business to know who asked it or who it is about, okay, let me say this, some of the best people I know in the Lord's body, okay, um, I'll give you first names, their names are Glenn and Randy, okay, some of the best men I've ever known in my life, okay, are men who know they were not qualified to serve as an elder, okay, they didn't meet the qualifications, okay, but they didn't let that stop them from being the servant of God they needed to be, and I applaud them, I think about them almost every day, uh, because I know, I know the kind of men they are, I've had discussions with them about all sorts of important spiritual matters, uh, and they haven't let that keep them from progressing in them being a servant of God. So if that's you, uh, or maybe more than one person in this room, don't let the fact that you're not qualified, at this point at least, to be an elder, deter you from doing the work that you need to be involved in. You can do so much just by making the decision, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get involved in the work as many ways that I can, and I can tell you that maybe the elders might, they might just come to you because you have some experience and maybe talk with you about some things. That, that may happen from time to time. But don't let that stop you. Okay? We need men who maybe aren't qualified to be elders, but to step up to the plate and continue to do the work and, and the preaching, teaching, song leading, public reading of the scripture, visiting, all those sorts of things. We need folks like that. All right? So don't let that kind of thing gets you down to the point where, you know what, I'm just going to give up. Don't ever give up. You don't ever give up in doing uh, good work. 
Okay, can an elder have only one child? I think we answered that, right? Sarah gave suck to what? Sarah gave suck to children, even though she only had one children, right? One child. Okay, can an elder not go to Wednesday night services? Okay. Um, I don't know the exact uh, reason for that. Let me say this. If he, if he could be here and decided he doesn't want to be here, that's a problem. Just like it was a problem for uh, that wife I mentioned earlier in the lesson. Okay, that's a big problem. Okay, because that shows a lack of desire to do what the Lord wants to be done. Now, can an elder, I asked about the elder's wife earlier, can, is an elder allowed to be sick? Yeah, he probably doesn't want to be sick, but he might be sick. Okay, so he may not be here on a Wednesday night. Okay, it may be that he's still working uh, a job. My father was still working when he became an elder. I, I bet if you asked him right now, he probably would have said, you know what, I might have waited for a few years for maybe the, some of the kids to, to be out of the house and to retire. Okay, I'm not speaking for him, but, but if you ask him, he might say something to uh, that effect. But I remember there were times where he had to work uh, a different shift from time to time. He may not be there uh, on a Wednesday night. Okay? Or maybe even sometimes uh, just depending on what shift he was. But if it's an habitual, on-purpose thing, that's a problem. Okay? That, that should be a problem. Because if the doors are open to the services, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and I can be there, I should be there as a child of God. You know, Hebrews 10, 25, we all know the verses, don't we? Okay, one that we don't often think about, though, is James 4, 17. For a man to know to do good, you know the rest of that, for a man to know to do good and do it not, to him it is what? To him it is sin. Okay? Uh, who, who in the right mind would see? I don't think it's a very good thing for us to be together on a Wednesday night study. I mean, that's, that's not a good thing. Anybody say that? I don't think so. Okay, so um, I'll try to answer all the, the parts of that question. Okay, but the one thing for sure is, Okay, if it's a choice, a mental choice that somebody's made that I'm just not going to go, that's, that's not a good thing. Okay, and that's for lots of reasons, but maybe the biggest one is example. Okay, uh, think about it in these terms. If every Christian in this building was like me, okay, if every Christian in this building was like me, okay, you know what the result of that is? And you, you can ask for yourself. Okay, it may be that nobody's here Wednesday night. Is that possible? If everybody's like me. Uh, everybody, the, the, there may not be any Sunday night services. That's possible too. The offering one day might be zero uh, because I decided not to offer on that particular day. You think about it. If every Christian in the local body was just like me in every way, what the result of that would be. Okay? And if he's on purpose doing that, then there would be nobody here. Okay? And the other members who are dutifully here on Wednesdays, and seeing that the elder, he could be here, but he's not. Okay, what can they learn from that? What will they learn from that? The lesson's obvious, isn't it? He's not, okay, it's not important to him, guess what? Not important to me. Okay, it's not important to me. Okay, we don't need that from um, the elders. We need to be a good example, as you read about First Peter chapter 5 and verse 3. Okay, how does the congregation go about setting... The eldership up after having men uh, that are qualified. Okay, that's a good question. We will answer that in detail, Lord willing, tomorrow night okay, at 6 o'clock. But I will say this. It needs to be orderly. It needs to be organized. It can't be something done haphazardly. Okay, I was talking to some of you. I think it's been, I mean, the, the last set of elders has been 60, what, 60, 50, 60 years ago. Okay, before this, when that process was done here. Okay. Uh, the, the, the preacher, Titus 1, verse 5, was left in Crete in order to send over those names that were lacking. I can't remember the names that of the, some of the preachers that you saw. McKee, I think, was one that came and probably did some lessons like this and kind of led the church through that process. There kind of needs to be somebody to lead through that process. But we'll say more about that tomorrow night uh, in our lesson. Okay, if a man desires to, uh, to an elder and has been divorced, but a scriptural divorce, would he be qualified? I think, I think we answered that as well. Now, one thing I will say, I didn't say in the lesson. Okay? Um, if that is a problem for a man who wants to be an elder, then I would say that would be a problem for any Christian who's in that position. Okay? Did, did the Lord give an exception in Matthew 19, verse 9? 
Matthew 5, 32, did he give an exception for, uh, for that? How many exceptions did he give? This one. Okay, what was the exception? Okay, fornication. I think some versions will say sexual immorality. Some of them will say something else. Okay, uh, so the Lord says, for that exception, I may put away somebody. Okay, and then be in a position to marry somebody else who themselves have the right to be married. Okay, I need to ha keep that in mind as well. If I, as a child of God, am permitted to do that by the Lord and still be found faithful, okay, what makes the difference then between whether I'm just a member of the Lord's body or somebody who aspires to be an elder who at the time is the husband of what? Husband of one wife. Okay, as we saw there in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3 and also Titus 1. Okay, husband of one wife. What does it mean? Uh, it means... At the time of his appointment, he is the husband of one wife. Okay, one wife uh, uh, only for life. Does not matter if widow or divorce for a scriptural reason. Okay, we've answered that. Okay, whether it's for purposes of death or a scriptural divorce. Uh, one wife at a time. Yes, that would be a good idea too. One wife at a time. Okay. Um, now, the, the language, some people have a little trip over the language. Husband of one wife. Okay. Um, that obviously that rules out polygamy, right? But it also rules out somebody being what? Th this is probably more of what it's ruling out. Okay, could poly was polygamy a problem in the Bible? It, yeah, I mean, there were some great men of faith in the Old Testament who had multiple wives. We're not going to get into that. Okay, more than ruling out polygamy, what it really rules out is somebody being what? Single, okay, not married, okay? Not married. That's really that's really the, the force of that. Okay, the husband of one wife. Okay, if you have somebody that's two wives, okay, we'll just go out and say it. He's not qualified. Okay, to be an elder. Okay, faithful children. Uh, what if they only have one child? We we've, we've talked about that. Uh, do the children have to be Christians or just uh, um, attend with parents? I think I think that's what it says. We've answered that as well. Uh, what if all but one is obedient? Okay, so there's there's a question we haven't answered yet. Okay, what if you have multiple children? Okay, you have you have children. Okay, two, three, four, five, whatever whatever it is. Okay, so now now the question becomes right is if I have we'll say for sake of argument three children, uh, two of them are Christians, but the third one is not. Okay, I'm gonna tell you I've changed my mind on that over the years, and I'm gonna tell you why. Because when my father became an elder. We had, he had five children, and all of us were Christians, okay? And I, I, I kind of automatically thought that that's just the way it is. All of them have to be Christians in order for him to be qualified to be an elder. Okay, so I, I, but once you begin to study and look at the language of the Bible, okay? Again, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly. He's in possession of children who are Christians. Okay, so if I have three children and two of them are Christians, am I in possession of faithful children? What's the answer to that? Yes, I am. I am in possession of faithful children. Okay, now some of that's going to come down to judgment, tolerance on the local level. Don't ask me to speak on that. Okay, uh, that's up to you guys. Okay, uh, you have situations where there's five kids, but only one is a Christian. Okay, is that different than having three and two of them, I mean, that's, that's for you guys to decide. But the qualification, he's in possession of faithful children. Okay? Think about, think about some questions here. Okay? Uh, any of you have any surprise children like we did with Levi? Somebody told me, somebody told me they had one that was, you were 19 years old, and then he had, who was that? He told me that. Okay. Okay. All right. So, if, if all children need to be Christians, okay? Now, let me say this real quick, too. I said it up here. I'm going to say it again. That's a wonderful thing. That's a good aspiration to have. Okay? We can see that. Okay? But that's where that stops because you have to, to read the qualification as it stated, having faithful children. Okay. Let's say uh, we, have, we have four children. Okay? And we have three children. All were Christians. Okay? Um, and I became an elder. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Okay? I really don't want to be. But we'll just we'll say it for sake of argument. I'll... I, I, I was. Okay, then here comes Levi. All of a sudden, surprise, I'm here. Okay, clearly he's not a what? 
He's not a Christian. Okay? So, based, based on that um, situation, then I would have to do what? I would have to step down as an elder until such time he could become what? He'd become a Christian. Okay? Then, then I could resume uh, my eldership duties. You see, you see what I'm saying? So there's some, there's some good questions to ask, some good things to think about there. Okay, some of that is, is uh, on a local level, a judgment call that has to be made. Okay, but, but the qualification reads having faithful children in possession of children who are Christians. Okay, let me give you a parallel. If the qualification said having healthy children, having healthy children, okay, and I have five children, but one of them is not healthy. Do I have healthy children? Am I in possession of healthy children? Yeah, I have four of them who are healthy. Okay, so we can see that there, can't we? Okay, so that's that's the parallel there. Okay, this is the last one, I believe. Okay, um, just some questions about the not given to wine. Uh, the individual here ever um, wrote this, noted a few different. I think the New American Standard says not addicted to wine. Uh, the KJV, NKJV, not given to wine. The NIV, uh, not given to drunkenness. Uh, I think I think that's ESV, not a drunkard. Uh, and there's, of course, there's multitudes of versions that you uh, could read. So they wanted just an elaboration because of some things that were said this morning. Uh, this seems, these seem to be describing abuse of wine or alcohol resulting in addiction or being drunk rather than a blanket restriction against all wine slash alcohol. Uh, can you elaborate more on why you say the, uh, the comments, uh, for comments from elders to abstain? Okay, we can say some things about that. Some of them will be the same. First off, the, qualifi the qualification says not given to wine. Okay, at least in the King James. Now, when you compare all the different versions, okay, what it's really saying is that he, he doesn't sit in the same place as wine. He doesn't find himself in the same place as intoxicating drink. Okay, an elder needs to be known for his sobriety. Okay, known for his sobriety. Now, you guys have probably have had discussions before, I don't know if you have or not, about social drinking and all of those things, whether or not it's right or wrong to social drink. Okay, I might, as I did this morning, recommend reading 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 3, where it runs the gamut from outright drunkenness okay, to maybe having a drink here or there. Okay, so I'm going to say this as, as kindly and as friendly as I can. Okay, if, if this question is coming from me, I, I often wonder, okay, why, why the question's about this? Okay, what, what, what's the question's about? Is it about, I would like to drink alcohol? Uh, I would like to take pleasure? What, what's, what's the question about? Okay, and I would recommend anybody, let's just all go back to Proverbs chapter 20. I want to read a couple of passages with you there. Okay, Proverbs 20. Proverbs 20 and verse 1. Wine, wine is a what? Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not what? Not wise. I would like for my elders to be what? I would like for them to be wise. Don't you? Okay, Proverbs 23, 29 through 32. 23, 29 through 32. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has babbling? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Okay, those are some good questions, aren't they? Okay, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder Do you know by the way the adder is the most venomous snake in the world okay if you get bit by the most venomous snake in the world guess what's going to happen you're going to die okay i want to die there's nothing that can be done for me if i'm bit by this snake referenced here in verse number 32 i will die there's no if ands or buts about that that's what's going to happen okay so the point that the wise man's trying to make here is if you're going to get full into thinking that you can dabble in this from time to time and be okay, 
think twice about that. That's what he's trying to say here. The wise man is trying to, to say. So going back then to the qualification, I don't know if I can say any clearer. Okay? Uh, it says not given to wine. Okay? Don't be sitting at the same table with wine. Okay, and let me say something, too, without getting real super deep into it, about the Bible definition of drunk, drunkenness. Okay, we hear drunkenness, okay, and we think somebody who's walking down the street, can't walk in a straight line, can't walk the chalk line, and all those things that Proverbs is talking about, the redness of eyes and all of those things. However, in the Bible, drunkenness primarily denotes the, the presence of alcohol in your system. Okay, whether you are to the point of being stupefied like we think of drunkenness as, or whether there's this alcohol uh, uh, in your system. Okay, somebody said, well, it takes me four beers to get drunk. Okay, if it takes you four beers to get drunk, you've probably done too much study on it to begin with, but if it does take you four beers to get drunk, one beer makes you 25% drunk. That's what it makes you. There's presence of alcohol in there. No Christians ever should be involved in any of this. Okay, none. Okay, and we're not going to get into the arguments. We don't have time for the, does wine mean intoxicating drink? Not always, but in most cases it does. Okay, uh, they didn't have the pasteurization that we have now. Okay, wine, grape juice became wine fermented very quickly because they don't, they didn't have the preservatives that we have now. You know, I noticed there was grape juice over at the place today. Is that wine? Well, I mean, in the strictest sense it is. Okay, but it's not intoxicating drink, okay, because now we have preservatives that can keep it grape juice, okay, as opposed to when it was in the Bible, okay, stay away from it, okay, elders don't need to be involved in it, deacons don't need to be involved in it, okay, and somebody may ask, what, what's the difference then between not giving to wine, not giving to much wine, okay, of course, wine in those days, at times, was used for all purposes. Okay, medicinal purposes. That's why Timothy was told to drink a little wine for what? Well, for what sake? For your stomach's sake. Not so you can get drunk and have a good time, but for your health sake. Okay, you remember Paul had a thorn in the flesh? Well, was, what, what was the thorn in the flesh? Do you know what the thorn in the flesh was? Okay, we don't know. It was a, I, I know what it was. It was a thorn in the flesh. That's what it was. Okay, apparently Timothy had stomach issues. Okay. What exactly stomach issues did he have? I don't know, but it doesn't tell us. But it does tell us he had some sort of his off off stomach issues, okay? And so he couldn't run down to uh, the CVS or the Walgreens or the Rite Aid or Walmart, okay, and talk to a trained uh, pharmacist about how to help with him and his stomach issues, could he? Okay, so in those days, they would have used that, okay? But in, in any case... Let me just say it as clear as I can. Christians don't need to be involved in that in any way, shape, or form. It's just not good. Uh, it's just not good at all. It's not a good example, and it's, it leads to bad, bad things. Okay. Okay, now I have my own questions. These are for you. Okay, I'll ask him that you can answer. Okay, some of these, some of these are for emphasis sake. It, we'll just say that. Okay, must there be a plurality of elders watching over a local flock of God's people? Must there be a plurality? Okay, yes. Okay, and how do you know that? It's plural. That's right. They are they ordain them elders. Acts 14, 23. Ordain elders. Titus 1, verse 5. Okay, and we can see we can see the the reason behind that. Okay, because one individual shouldn't be trying to oversee a whole flock. There's a, there's a whole host of problems uh, with that. Okay, must each man meet each listed qualification in order to be eligible to serve as an elder? Yes, okay, yes, the answer is yes. Sometimes groups want elders so bad. This is what I was trying to say last night, okay? They want elders so bad. That's a good thing, okay? But this man meets some of them, and this man meets some of them, and this man meets some of them, and collectively they all meet the qualifications. Therefore, we're going to ordain all of them elders. Should it work that way? No, it shouldn't work that way. You're asking for some trouble. Okay, should elders be followed at all cost, even if it, <clears throat> even if they ask or require the flock to go beyond the written word? Let me repeat that. Should elders be followed at all costs, 
even if they ask or require the flock to go beyond the written word? No. Okay, absolutely not. Okay, our, fir our first concern is following who? Following God. Okay, can you then give a verse that would illustrate? Okay, I'll give you as many clues as I can without giving them to you. Where it says, you know, if you come to a crossroads, you ought to go with God and not some man. Isn't there a verse something like that somewhere? Maybe you know what it says, but not where it is. Okay, that's a good one. Matthew 6, 24. You cannot serve God and man. Okay, mammon. Okay, it's impossible to serve God and anybody else acceptably. Very good. That's a good one. Where else? Okay. <coughs> okay, yeah, you may be thinking of something different than me, but let me, let me try to take a stab at what you're thinking of. They were arrested and sent back out into the town and say, don't teach this anymore. And their response was, we ought to do what? We ought to obey God rather than men. Okay, that's Acts 5.29. We ought to obey God rather than men. Okay, this is the true of elders. This is true of parents. This is true of husbands. If somebody asks us to do something contrary to God's law, we must obey who? We must obey God. Okay, at all costs, we must obey God. Okay, can elders make a final determination regarding the work and worship of the local flock without having consulted each and every member? Yes. Okay. The answer is yes. Now, as I intimated in this morning's lesson, I believe, they, good elders, will try to take the input of the congregation. We're, we're thinking about making some uh, changes in the order of service, for instance. Okay, do you, have any, do you have any suggestions? Okay, this is kind of what we're thinking of. What do you think about this? They're going to ask those kinds of questions. Okay, they may not ask everybody. Okay, so I shouldn't be upset. Okay, if you know, you didn't come and ask me if the, if the giving can be done before, uh, I don't know how you guys do that, but we, at First City we do the giving prior to the Lord's Supper. Okay, you didn't ask me. Well, they don't have to ask every single member about every single decision they make. Okay, they have, they're given, what we refer to as delegated authority. What's delegated authority? There's inherent authority and there's delegated authority. Inherent authority is by virtue of who you are, by your position. In essence, there's really only one who has inherent authority. Who is that? God. Okay, everybody else has delegated authority. Elders have delegated authority because it's been given to them, okay, to rule the flock and to oversee the flock. Okay, we'll say more about that um, in other lessons. May an elder be financially supported for his labor? May an elder be financially supported for his labor? Okay, yes, he may. Okay, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17 uh, speaks to that. That's 1 Timothy 5 and verse number 17. And there's a word, a hyphenated word in there in some versions. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, Especially they who labor in the word, in the word and doctrine. Okay, some people, I, I didn't know I could go past single honor. I mean, what what more can I do than single honor? Okay, honor meaning what? Respect, reverence, appreciation for the work that's being done. Okay, the the idea of a double honor intimates um, support for their work. Okay, there may be elders. I've known of elders who are at the building every day. Okay, and they're visiting every day. They're retired. They're out doing things, elder-like things, all the time. Okay, and we they can be supported for that, for that work. Okay, when should an elder resign? Here's a big one. When should an elder resign? There's an easy answer to this one. When, when he's no okay. When he no longer desires, or when he lo, when he no longer is qualified. Okay, okay. Yeah, if he loses the desire, guess what? He's not qualified. We talked about that this morning, didn't we? Okay, maybe his wife dies, passes away. Does that ever happen? That's happened, that's happened probably, hasn't it? Okay, is he the husband of one wife? Yeah, he was when he was appointed. Okay, those, those things need to persist, right? At the time of his appointment, okay, and they, they run through his service. Okay, is he the husband of one wife anymore? He's not. Okay, he's not. Okay. And that's an unfortunate situation, but it has rendered many congregations elderless for the time being. 
okay? So, so the answer is, and, and Rich kind of hit on it, basically, when he lo no longer is what? When he's no longer qualified, okay? That's when he should resign. Now, let me say this. Do all elders resign when they should? Probably not, okay? The answer is no, they don't, okay? That's, that's a very dangerous situation. Okay, when an elder is not qualified, okay, and the congregation is, is no longer willing to um, follow him as an elder because they realize he's not qualified, but he, he refuses to step down as an elder, that's a very, very dangerous situation for that flock. Okay, and that needs to, needs to be dealt with as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Now, if they are qualified, that tends to make me think he's not qualified. All right, because if, if he were qualified and he realized he's not qualified for the sake and peace and safety of that flock, he would do what? He would step down. Okay, because he's not going to be the reason why there's division in any local place. Okay, uh, may a preacher also serve as an elder? Yes, the answer is yes. Okay, I, I hinted at that in the sermon. Okay, that I have no desire to do that. Okay, and there's, there's some reasons behind that. Okay, if I were not a located preacher somewhere, okay, not, and uh, I just was identified with a local group that might be different. Okay, but in my mind, there's a lot of, in my mind, this, this is my mind speaking, okay? Don't, don't go out and say, now Larry says, no preacher could be an elder. Okay, don't go out there and say that because that's not what I'm saying. Okay, there's a lot of conflicts of lack of better word, interest, okay? But I'm not saying an elder is doing a bad thing if he's serving as an elder. All right, because he can. He very, he very easily can. Okay, if he, if he meets what? If he meets the qualifications. Okay, are there some people preaching today who don't meet the qualifications of, yeah. He may, he may not even be what? He may not even be married. He may, he may not have many children. Okay, but he can still preach the word, right? Okay, as we see in, in other, other places. Okay, um, so yes, he can be. But he doesn't, he doesn't have to be, okay, in those sorts of things that you can think uh, along those lines. Okay, I, in my mind, just as we're talking out loud with each other, if there were two elders and I was one of them and I was a located preacher as well, and, and one elder said, you know, I think it's time for us to make a change of preachers, that might get a little what? <laughs> that might get a little hairy. Okay, so, oh, wait, wait a second. I don't, I don't think there is a time for us to change. Okay, so you, you understand what I'm saying. Okay, another situation that comes up is cost of living raises, those, those sorts of things. Preachers and money can become very sticky situations. Okay, I'm always thankful for the support that's offered to us. Any, anytime I was ever in a business meeting, a necessary evil I talked about last night, and, and preacher pay came up, oh, I, I'm, just, I'm just like, I'll just, I'm going to excuse myself. You guys can talk, you know, however you want, because I'm, it's just not a, but, you know, you can see those kinds of things coming up can be kind of some situations I really don't personally want to be in. I want to concentrate on doing my job as a preacher, okay, which can be summed up in three words. You know what three words those are? Preach the word, okay? Where's that at? 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, okay? 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5, summarize 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, okay? Now... Since I'm asking about those books and we're talking about elders, okay, are First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus are those the pastoral epistles? Have you heard them referred to as the pastoral epistles before? First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus are they the pastoral epistles? Who says yes? Who says no? Who says there's no ammo in my hand and getting in the middle of this? Okay, the answer is no, and here's why. They were not written to pastors, okay? They were written to who? Evangelists, okay? Are preachers pastors? Not in most cases, they're not. If they're serving as an elder, then they can refer to themselves as a pastor, okay? A preacher, how can you refer to him? Three ways, what are they? I think I heard minister, is that what I heard? Minister, preacher, evangelist, okay? And really, they're not titles. They're more descriptions of the work that are being done. Okay, a preacher brings glad tidings. Evangelist goes out and evangelizes. And a minute, another word for minister is what? Servant. Because it's after after what he is, he's a servant. Okay, so that's the three ways that I can be referred to 
he can just call me Larry. That, that'll be fine. Okay. Now, one more thing. If a preacher is serving as an elder, I would recommend him not getting up to preach a sermon and saying uh, that I'm the pastor here. Okay. And I'm, I'm getting ready to preach a lesson. Okay. Would you recommend that? Probably not. Okay. That's, that's going to lead to, I already saw some of you go, hmm, what's that mean? Okay. So you can imagine what the visitors might think. Okay. In that situation. Okay. Okay. Um, let me ask a few things. We're not going to talk much about deacons. Okay. Um, I, did, I think I already mentioned this, that deacons work under what? Under the oversight of the elders. That's why there cannot be any deacons when there are no elders. Okay. Now, is there deacon-like work being done right now? Yeah. I, I see some of it being done uh, as I'm standing up there. Okay. But in terms of holding the office... Okay, it can't be done because they work under the oversight of the elders. Okay, so just so we drive that point home, how much oversight do deacons have? None. Okay, who has the oversight? The elders do. Okay, we'll talk a lot more about that tomorrow when we talk about the flock's responsibility to the elders, the elders' responsibility to the flock. Okay, because they, it's a two-way street Okay, that each of us need to be uh, aware of. Okay. Um, are deacons less important than elders? That's a good question to ask right now, since I just said that. Are deacons less important than elders? No. Okay. Are, are there any members that are less important than the elders? No. Okay. I just got done preaching a lesson not too long ago entitled, We Are Fellows. Okay. Go do, go do a research on the word fellow in the Bible. And notice all the ways that we are fellows. Can you list some right now? We are fellow what? I'm sorry? I heard two things at once. Right, our fellow heirs. Romans 8 talks about that. Yeah, fellow citizens. Okay, but the point I was trying to make is, is that we are in this what? We are in this together, okay? Not, not one person is more important than the other, okay? And I'm going to tell you right now, some preachers are made to feel as though they are more important than the other people. Okay, it's like the clergy laity distinction that is made in some denominations that the clergy is important, everybody else, you have to listen to him. It's not, that's not the case in the Lord's church. Okay, we are fellows. That was the point of the sermon. Okay, fellow citizens, fellow heirs, fellow laborers, uh, fellow prisoners. Go, do, go look at that. There's a lot of different ways that we are fellows. We're in this together. Okay, so uh, although deacons don't have oversight, that doesn't mean that they are less important in any way because their, their work is very important, whether it's audio, visual stuff, or checking on widows that might need some help, or any number of things. That, that work is very important and doesn't need uh, to be a look down upon. May women, may women serve as elders or deacons? No. Okay, we answered that right off the bat this morning, didn't we? Does that diminish the importance of women? Are women are less important than men? Okay. Husbands, try that on your wife tonight. You're less important than me. Okay, see how that goes. Okay, that's not going to go very well, is it? Okay, uh, they have a role to fill too. Okay, a very important role. Does the Bible speak of organization in the universal, in the universal church sense? Does the Lord's church have universal organization? No. Okay, if you were to tell me yes, then my question would be, where is our headquarters? Where is the national headquarters of the Church of Christ. It's probably in Cincinnati, isn't it? That seems like a good place for it. Okay. Or the international headquarters of the Church of Christ. Where's that at? Okay. The fact is there's no earthly headquarters. Okay. Does the Church of Christ have headquarters? It's in heaven. That's exactly right. Why do you say that? That's where we're heading toward. And that's where our head is. Okay. Wherever your head is, that's where your what is. That's where your headquarters are at. Christ is our head. He's in heaven. That's where our headquarters are at. Okay. Each, what's that fancy word? Okay. That begins with A. Each local church is what? Autonomous. Okay. What's that mean? Self-govern. Okay, I think that's what I heard. Self-govern. Do the elders at Gadsden, when that comes to fruition again, hopefully soon, do the elders at Gadsden have the right to go to the elders? Uh, down in Plainfield and say, you know, you guys are doing this all wrong. You guys, you guys are messing this up. You need to do it this way. No. Yep. They have no oversight of that group. Okay. And we will see that tomorrow. 
Feed the flock of God which is among you. That's a very important word there in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5. Okay, um, let's see. Last one. Are there judgment calls to be made with regard to certain aspects of elders, deacons, and local church organization? Yes. Okay, I, I've already told you that. It is going to be, we, we can see the black and white qualifications, and we've, we've seen them all today now. Okay, we talked about all of them. Okay, but within those, there's going to be some judgment calls that have to be made on the local level. Okay, knowing that, knowing that, what kind of attitude should we have towards one another? Okay, love. That's a good place to start. Okay, uh, I, too often when we, we start searching for elders, the first automatic thing is he can't be an elder because of this, and he can't do an elder. I mean, it's all negative right off the bat. Okay, shouldn't be that way, should it? Okay, so love, what else? Respect. Okay, respect. The, they are your fellow heir. Okay, you need to respect them. Okay, what did you say? Patience. Have some patience to the process. Okay, it is a process that has to be gone through. Okay, and if any of you have been here for less than 50 years, you haven't gone through it. Okay, but hopefully you'll be going through it sometime soon. Okay, it can become, if allowed... A very difficult process where there are hurt feelings and people aren't talking to each other. I know it's hard for some of you to believe, but it has happened before. That's why it needs to be orderly, organized, have love, have some respect, okay? have some patience. Anything else you might add to that? Compassion. That's a good word. You know, the word compassion in the Bible is interesting, you know? What does the word compassion mean since you brought that up? I mean, in your own words. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. No. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I kind of all kind of rolled all up one. Okay. There's a little rhyme that might help you to remember compassion. Compassion is action. Okay. Compassion is action. Okay. Compassion is not merely. Yeah. I, I feel really sorry for that guy. I hope. So, I hope. I hope, I hope your things turn out okay. okay. When the Samaritan came by that man on the road to Jericho, the Bible says he had what? He had compassion on him. Okay. Now, did the priest and the Levi have compassion on him? Okay. Probably not. I mean, it doesn't tell us what they were thinking. Okay. Their actions tell us they had very, if they had any, it was very little. Because all they did was walk by on the other side. One of them actually went over, looked at him, for whatever reason, came back and went down the road. Okay. Now I could say maybe they maybe they had some feeling inside of them that I kind of feel sorry for that guy, but I don't have time for this. I, I'm on my way to jail. I've got to do something. Okay. I don't, you know, whatever. Okay. But the com the compassionate fellow came by and did something. That's what compassion is. Compassion means you do something for somebody. Okay, so that, that compassion is a good concept here. Kindness, generosity, courtesy, those sorts of things. We're all brethren. Okay, and we're all still going to be brethren when the process is over. Whether, you know, whenever you guys go through it, you're going to be brethren when it's over, whether you have elders or not. You're still going to be brethren. You have to, you have to live with each other. Okay. Okay. All right. That's all the questions that were submitted, and that's all the ones... Um, on my paper, if you have another private question you want to ask, I'll be certainly glad to entertain those. I think you guys said there's going to be one more song. Okay, one more song, 47, and then, uh, then I assume we'll have a closing prayer.